Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. We are now entering our second panel session with two keynote speakers. First is Dr. Yuj Johan Pape from World Bank. And second is Professor Daryono, Universitas Terbuka, Indonesia. The second panel discussion will be led by Daniel Pasaribu as the moderator. Mr. Daniel Pasaribu, now you are welcome to lead this session. Suara nggak masuk. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yona. Uh, before I start the second panel discussions, uh, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear my voice clearly. Uh, can you hear my voice, ladies and gentlemen? Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a special privilege and a pleasure to welcome you on this second panel discussions. My name is Daniel Pasaribu, and I will be your moderator during this second panel discussions. The development of technology innovations for the last two decades has shifted the way we live, especially in the field of internet. A couple months ago, CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, hit the headlines, revealing more of his visions of the metaphors. Therefore, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, in the second sessions, we are going to hear another insight related to the theme about perspectives and impact of metaphors on sustainable development goals from two distinguished speakers. Honorable speakers, distinguished guests, fellow colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Before we start the presentations, I would like to remind you, in order to avoid any disturbance and inconveniences during the presentations later, I would like to ask you to mute your microphone. Thank you. On these occasions, we shall have outstanding presentations from our prominent presenters, whom I believe shall enrich our insights and knowledge regarding the theme of this seminar. Before the presentation begins, allow me to briefly explain the personal profile of our presenters. The first presenter is Dr. Uts John Pap. Dr. Uts John Pap was graduated from the International Max Planck Research School and the Free University of Berlin and was a postdoctoral associate at Harvard University. He also completed his education in international development from the London School of Economics and the School for International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He also completed some of the projects such as he leads teams to design and implement landing projects to improve national statistical systems and to prepare analytical work with a focus on the nexus between digital as well as climate change with poverty. His work experience in past conflict countries contribute to his research agenda, including forced displacements as well as the design of methodologies for poverty measurements in fragile set, set, settings. His research has received awards and is published in peer review journals, including Nature. In January 2020, he published a book with Johannes Hugevens on data collection in fragile states, innovations from Africa. And the second 
presenter is Professor Dr. Daryono from Universitas Terbuka. Professor Dr. Daryono completed his education at Faculty of Law Universitas Diponegoro. He was graduated from the law faculty and he also completed his Master of Arts from the University of Victoria. It's not enough there, he also completed his uh, PhD, Doctor of Philosophy from Faculty of Law at the Australian National University. He was the head of the Center for Research and Innovations of the Open and Distance Educations at Universitas Terbuka, and he is a professor of law in the program study of law Universitas Terbuka. In terms of the associations, ladies and gentlemen, he's a member of the International Collaborative Research on Open Education Resources, funded by the International Development Research Center, Canada, from 2010 to 2013. He was also an international collaborative research on research on OER for development funded by IDRC from 2014 to 2017. He was a member of Working Research Group on Sustainable Agriculture, land investment contract funded by the International Institute for Unification of Private Law from 2017 to 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very important also for us to see that Professor Dariano is a Universitas Trabuca team leader for collaborative research, the BUKA project with Egg University in Southeast Asia and Europe, funded by the European Union or Erasmus from 2019 to 2022. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Ut Joan Pep, to present the material of today's seminar. To Dr. Ut, the floor is yours. Okay, perfect. Um, can you uh, hear me? Very clear, Super. Dr. Ut. Thank you, and I hope you can also see my screen. Um, so, um, thank you so much for the, um, uh, for the, uh, very nice introduction. I'm, I'm very glad to be, um, part of this, of this conference. Um, I'm not going to say too much then about myself because you've just seen this in the slide before. My name is Otz Pap and I'm a senior economist, um, at the World Bank. I'm actually, um, based in Jakarta in Indonesia. Um, and my portfolio is very much focused on poverty and equity. And um, as you might have seen in the past year, we have published the report Beyond Unicorns, um, which has been written by one of my colleagues, uh, Silesh Tivari. Um, and I'm going to sort of base most of the presentation on this work. Um, I mean, the conference is much more about the metaverse. Um, however, the metaverse, of course, does um, sort of take as a, as a foundation, as a base, uh, very much digital and the digital economy. And so I'm going to much more focus on the digital economy itself. Like, what does it mean? What kind of opportunities does it create? And then also relate this, not as much specifically to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, but much more broadly in what does it mean for making sure that everybody in the society can actually join and participate in opportunities that are provided by the digital economy. And so while we much more talk about the digital economy, um, I did think a little bit beyond that in terms of like the metaverse and what would that mean with the um, with implications for the metaverse. And it is um, very similar. And if I've got time in the last um, and uh, at the end, I'm going to share a few thoughts on how I exactly see sort of like this, um, this, the implications or like the differences between the digital economy versus the metaverse, which basically just goes one step further. So let me um, uh, start with the presentation. Um, digital economy, I mean, well, the conference is about metaverse, I'm talking about the digital economy, but nevertheless, I think it is quite important to define and be quite specific of like what we actually mean by that. Um, like 
the digital economy itself is, of course, any kind of service um, that can be provided through the digital, uh, like through digital media. Um, and this does not necessarily mean that it's only digital services, but we also, of course, include into the digital economy, um, the gig economy, where something is ordered digitally, but then delivered sort of like in an analog way by someone who's bringing the good to someone. Um, now, the simple question that I'd like to start with is, um, how can the digital economy or the internet make our lives better? And with our lives, I really mean the ones in all of the society and not just some of the more privileged groups within the society. Um, so first, for the digital economy, we can benefit as consumers. As consumers, we can stay connected with friends, with family, um, you know, via the typical messaging apps, via email. Um, we can also find out what's actually happening in the world, for example, using Twitter. And well, we can even go a step further and we can order goods and services online um, directly to our homes. Um, then there's a second sort of like big dimension about the workers. Um, the digital economy can create new jobs. It can change existing jobs. It can also um, remove and eliminate some jobs. And it can also create new channels of distribution. So if you think about e-commerce, it can provide workers the ability to basically uh, expand markets like massively. And we're going to come back to this later. Now, the third dimension is the recipient of services. Um, so people in the society, like everybody, can receive government services in a much easier way using the digital connection that can make services being able to reach participants faster and easier with better quality. And they can also be better targeted because if the government has, for example, a database with um, everybody who is, let's say, poor, then it is much easier to like roll out a payment program to reach everybody who is poor. And I mean, that's something we've seen a little bit in the context of COVID-19. However, to basically harness the benefits from these three different dimensions as consumers, as workers, and as uh, recipients of government services, obviously, we first need to make sure that there's connectivity. Without connectivity, well, it is really hard to connect digitally. So let me first spend a few minutes on discussing connectivity, because this really has very fundamental implications for who can actually um, benefit from the digital economy. Mm, so what is the situation with connection, connectivity in Indonesia? So if you look back, Indonesia has made huge strides forward. There were like very large investments from private investors, expanding the access um, to networks, uh, like uh, basically across all the different districts. The fiber optic backbone has been uh, has been finalized, so all districts are connected to the to the backbone. Um, and it is actually part of the fastest growing economy. So this sounds all very good. And if you look at, for example, the percent of people who've been connected to the internet, um, there was like 13% in 2011. And that basically um, was almost like um, uh, increased fivefold but, uh, in 2019 to 51%. And this sounds really good. It's like 51% of the population is connected. However, at the same time, it also means that, well, half of the population is not yet connected. And so as we see on the next slide, it is not a random subgroup of people who is not yet connected. It's a very specific kind of subgroup because as you can see on this slide, the um, basically the uh, this the um, disparity between the connectivity in the of the urban population and the rural population has remained constant. So while two thirds of the urban population are connected, only one third of the rural population is connected. And like thinking back to like the initial slide, what I've mentioned is well, this automatically creates an inequity in access to internet to in and that with that to access to the digital economy, and that's something that is really important to keep in mind. Also, if you look at the different um, regions within Indonesia, you can see that, for example, in Java, Bali, half of the population is connected, while in Papua, only a third is connected. So it's not only the urban-rural divide that exists, there's also a divide 
between different regions. And well, if we would have time, we could look deeper into it and we could all, we'd also realize that there's actually also a difference between um, education levels and house of households. The other one that I wanted to show you is the difference by income levels. You can see that the top earners, that's the top bar, um, has almost five times more access to internet than the poorest 10%, which is the lowest bar. And so obviously this points us to the fact that affordability is a key constraint of like being able to connect uh, and use the digital economy. Now, this is about mobile internet mainly, but fixed broadband is really important. Fixed broadband is very important. Um, for example, in, um, in health, in education, um, applications because they use um, like uh, much more internet, uh, like much more bandwidth than is usually done with mobile. But also a lot of firms, especially firms in IT, but not only, they also need much, uh, much, uh, a much quicker access to internet. Um, and of course, if you think about the metaverse, uh, this requires quite a bit of bandwidth. And it's, uh, at least to me, it's not very clear whether mobile internet with the current uh, bandwidth is actually sufficient to deliver that. Now, if you look here, you can see Indonesia, I mean, there's no, ex there's no access, but in Indonesia, the access um, to broadband internet is 4%. And so you can see that it lags behind massively through its peers. And not only that, also 4% of access to broadband internet is really low by itself. Um, here on this next slide, um, we show a little bit the constraints of um, why there's not as much connection to broadband internet. And this is based on a survey that was connect, uh, co conducted for this report. And you can see almost half. 44% report that broadband internet is too expensive, while another 14% report that they have no provider that is nearby. So this is like a huge constraint. Basically, two thirds of the population cannot connect to broadband internet for these two reasons. And then there is a quarter which feels that mobile internet is sufficient. And I'm going to come back to this in a second. Um, so it all points to affordability. And there's, by the way, also like a statistics from the ITU that ranks um, uh, different countries. And Indonesia ranks 131 out of 200 um, in terms of fixed line subscription fees, showing that the broadband internet access in Indonesia is particularly expensive. And this is linked to, and we come back to this a little bit later, to the fundamental structure of the broadband market and the regulations that govern it in Indonesia. Um, now, if you look and compare mobile internet to the left with the broadband internet to the right, and you compare the speeds, what is really interesting is if you see, if you look at Singapore, you can see that the broadband internet is almost four times faster. While if you look at Indonesia, I mean, first, you, of course, recognize that among peers, Indonesia is not doing very well. But if you compare the speeds between mobile and um, fixed broadband, you can see that the difference is really marginal. Uh, and that's not as much because the mobile internet is really good. The problem much more is that the fixed broadband internet is really bad in terms of its quality. It's really slow. And therefore, it's not as much surprising that you see before that a lot of people actually respond that they already have mobile internet and that broadband internet doesn't make much of a difference, which is actually unfortunately true in terms of speed. The reason behind this quality difference is uh, congestion a lot. Um, and so this points you then to a, a number of different constraints um, that, for example, it is really difficult to do proper e-commerce, video streaming, video conferences, remote healthcare, remote education services with this kind of broadband internet. Um, and these are, of course, really important as we've seen in the last two years over the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so if we go sort of like close this topic of connectivity and look what does the population actually use internet for? Uh, it's really interesting to see that Indonesia are actually the ones who use internet extremely intensely. They are like the fifth highest um, usage of internet following the Philippines, Brazil, Thailand, and Colombia. Um, so, um, and so on the next slide, I also show a little bit the, um, the, the usage of internet. So on average, Indonesians spend six hours online. And this is on average. Of course, there are big differences between different age classes because the younger, uh, for example, the ones between 16 and 25 years old use internet much more. On average, they're using it 
10 hours uh, per day. Um, and this is why, uh, why actually Indonesia is one of the leading uh, countries in terms of usage of internet, uh, once, uh, like if people are connected at all. And so you can see what, what are people using internet for? Uh, a third on communications, a fifth on social media, another fifth on leisure, and then a little bit on browsing and others. And you can also see that actually e-commerce, like buying and selling is only 3%. So from the snapshot, and this was done in 2019 before the COVID-19 pandemic, so this might have changed a little bit, but you can see that a lot of this, like a half, is focused on communication and social media. Um, so e-commerce um, is one of the largest components of Indonesia's digital agenda. It's the main driver of growth, uh, was and was also like the main driver of growth in the pandemic as part of like the digital sector. Um, now, what are the benefits of e-commerce? Um, so you can see um, that local non-availability as well as product variety together is almost like a third of the, adva that, the advantage that consumers see from e-commerce. So you get products and services that you usually wouldn't have gotten without being digitally connected. And at the same time, you've got bigger choice. Now, almost a half of the respondents also mentioned price as a big uh, advantage because obviously you suddenly, um, the, the suppliers are competing with many more other suppliers. And therefore, as a consumer, you've got not only bigger choice, but you also benefit from lower prices. Um, so let's um, move on and move a little bit closer to like what other means does a uh, digital economy actually open up? And so one of the well, very famous ones, and I think uh, all of you are aware of this, are the ride hailing apps. So one in four Indonesia, uh, one of four Indonesians um, in urban uh, areas use digital ride hailing apps. And most of them actually use them for commuting. So on like an everyday basis. And this was actually, all of this was before the pandemic. So these numbers might have even been uh, increased since then. Now, the ride hailing apps are quite helpful, but they actually open up a whole different set of services that can be used um, through the digital sphere. And of course, some of them, like the more famous ones are of course, like the food delivery apps or other delivery apps that the, uh, the biggest um, platforms are offering in Indonesia. And 21% are actually using those um, already before the pandemic. And as I've said, I mean, we probably would expect that even more use them um, um, these days. Um, so now let's turn to the labor market. So this was like the first dimension was the consumer. And now we're moving to the second dimension, which is the labor market before we go to the recipients uh, of government services. Now, what kind of opportunities does digital create? So digital gig work is really important. And this uh, you can see here on this slide, one third of um, labor market, uh, so sorry, one third of gig workers are actually using um, the gig economy as their first job. So it is an entrance into the labor market, which is really good to see. Um, it pays better, like the earnings are on average 6% higher. But at the same time, you can also see that um, Indonesians in the gig economy work longer, 10 hours longer than the average worker. So it is hard work, but it pays better and it is an entrance into the labor market. Um, now, something that is not shown as explicitly on this slide, but it's really important to mention here is that this is um, done, like gig work is done by a very specific group of workers. 85% of all digital workers are men, 87% are living in urban areas, and 69% are in transportation, storage, and communication sector. And so with that, again, it's not that these digital opportunities are being accessible for all. Um, now, e-commerce is also, and I've mentioned it a couple of times already before, really important. 10% of the of workers are actually engaged in e-commerce. It's more commonly used as a second job than a primary job. So it's much more of like complementing salary, like family income. And especially women doing household work as primary work, they often engage in e-commerce as a secondary job. And so this is really interesting to see because in Asia and especially in Indonesia, there was um, always a challenge of activating women to join the labor market. And it seems that e-commerce can be an important block in like uh, activating women in the labor market. However, while e-commerce has increased and spread all over the country, its intensity is still concentrated in the most populous areas like Java, Bali, for example. So further expansion to areas outside the most Excuse populous me, parts. Dr. Utz, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You still have five minutes to left. Yeah, that's it. perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so, um, and to overcome like this focus of the intensity on specific parts in Indonesia, um, 
there are certain specific challenges and they are listed on the right-hand side of the slide. The first one is the cost of logistic. And the th third one is the connectivity. And I mean, the, the third one I've already alluded to in the first part of the presentation, but here it's really important to keep in mind that fixing connectivity problems and making sure that logistics can actually also deliver goods and services that are, for example, ordered through the digital economy is really important. And then the other important point is the limited trust in digital payments. And I'm going to come back to this as well. Um, even among the people who use e-commerce, 50% prefer cash on delivery. So it's not as much um, that you see that people are actually using digital payments yet. Um, now, the overall picture, if you move then from e-commerce to like firms, then you can see on the left-hand side, the adoption of digital among firms is really low and it's worryingly low, especially among the micro and the small enterprises, while medium and large enterprises actually um, see back uh, like higher adoption. Um, now, firms that do join the digital economy see their sales going up on average. Um, but we also see that this is especially true for firms that are owned and operated by higher educated workers with longer entrepreneurial experience. And so, again, this shows you the, um, like the challenge that the digital economy can also create winners and losers. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see basically the same message for household enterprises, that especially the ones which um, are richer on the right-hand side uh, are able to better use internet than the ones that are uh, not uh, let, that are poorer in the uh, income distribution of the country. Now let's switch gears and see how people as recipients of government services um, have benefited from digital. Obviously that's an area that COVID-19 has put a spotlight on. So Indonesia has an emerging ed and health tech sector, I'm sure you're all aware of, and good news is that all these innovations, they've been actually utilized as part of the pandemic. And while they are important, Unfortunately, often their reach is limited. And what really counts for like innovative solutions is the experience to scale. And that's when these innovations actually become transformative. That's what international experience teaches us. However, the first constraint is, and I've uh, put my finger on this already, connectivity, especially for education services in the pandemic, for example. Um, and that's both access to connectivity as well as the quality of uh, connectivity. Now, the second constraint is the digital infrastructure, uh, sorry, the digital identification, which is a prerequisite for many services, especially the ones involving transactions, financial uh, transactions especially, but also more generally transactions with the government. Now, the successful rapid deployment, for example, of social assistance, and we've seen this as part in the COVID-19 pandemic, would have really benefited if there would have been a digital ID framework in place for better targeting of beneficiaries. So even though... Um, uh, Indonesia has a very strong national ID system, it's not yet digitalized, and that would be a low-hanging fruit with potentially very huge returns. Of course, it's important here to keep in mind that one should also put in place guardrails to protect against the risk of breaches against privacy, exclusion, and price discrimination, and that would be really important. And the um, SATU data regulation, of course, goes an important step uh, with, uh, as part of the regulation, but there's, of course, more space to um, to, uh, to make sure that this regulation is being implemented. Now, the third constraint is the fragmentation of data and systems and the lack of coordination and leadership constraint, especially in terms of like transforming the government from like siloed digital applications towards a whole of government approach to deliver services. Um, and this includes, uh, for example, also data management systems, now, which should not be separate and siloed in different ministries, but there should be one big data management system that everybody has regulated access to. Um, so let me stop here with sort of like uh, the facts and the challenges and quickly say a few words about what can be done. What should government do? And we can classify them in three different groups. The first one, to improve digital connectivity and universalized access. The second one, to make the digital economy work for all. And the third, to use digital technologies to upgrade services. So I've got one slide for each of them um, very quickly, um, sort of like being a little bit more specific of what it means. So in terms of the first one, the improved connectivity and universalized access, it's about optimizing the spectrum, uh, allocating high frequency bands for, uh, for connectivity, but also um, out 
so like um, using some of the other frequency bands and uh, allocating them to digital um, services, then strengthening the share of active and passive infrastructure so that private investors need to share passive infrastructure, which lowers the entry costs of, uh, of competitors. And this can reduce prices and reduce uh, in increase the quality of services. And then third, to strengthen the competition along the broadband value chain, for example, by a bundled licensing of digital services to allow um, uh, private sector investors to not only um, deliver one service, but multiple services, as well as compatibility across services, for example, by being able to use your phone number across different providers. The second one to make the digital economy work it's to support the development of logistics, as I've sort of like emphasized quite a bit, to promote financial inclusion, to make sure that everybody has access to, for example, digital financial services, to boost digital skills, to make sure that everybody can take part of the digital economy, and then finally to use tax policy instruments to ensure a playing field. Now, the third one, to use digital technology to upgrade services, I've mentioned those very explicitly, is to develop a national digital IT framework, embrace a whole-of-government approach, and moves towards a whole-of-government data integration and management with a clear leadership role of an, uh, of, uh, of like an institution. So this is all that I wanted to show. And let me quickly finish with sort of like one more sentence on like the metaverse. So the metaverse, I think, much more requires digital skills and digital connectivity than sort of like the more basic digital economy that I focus a lot on. However, the constraints, for example, in terms of giving connectivity to have the skills um, to participate in the metaverse, they remain and are actually higher for the metaverse than to the digital economy. And so this also means that the risk of a um, digital divide for the metaverse, I think is even more likely than for the digital economy. And so this means that to push towards the metaverse, we also do need to make sure that there is a level playing field, for example, in terms of connectivity, affordability of connectivity, of digital skills among everybody, so that everybody actually can take the opportunities that the metaverse offers and that we are not creating a digital divide. So let me uh, stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Us. What a very interesting and comprehensive explanations. And I agree with Dr. Us that uh, it is very important yeah, for Indonesia to provide the digital skills and also the connectivity. And also in terms of the quality, that's the problems that we uh, face. And now uh, I would like to invite our second presenter, uh, our second presenter is Professor Dr. Daryono from Universitas Terbuka. To Professor Dr. Daryono, the floor is yours. Okay, okay, Daniel, thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear my voice? Uh, yes, Prof. Very okay, clear. Good. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I think first uh, I would like to thanks to the organizing committee uh, for inviting me uh, to speak on this conference. And uh, I would uh, very uh, appreciate for uh, bringing this topic because the metaverse is uh, uh, quite new and uh, bringing a kind of a, a fascinating and intriguing uh, discussion uh, related to uh, what, why, and uh, how actually. But in these sessions, uh, I think uh, it's it's becoming more and more interesting because uh, now the metaverse uh, as the uh, Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Google, and also NVIDIA Unity uh, software uh, already place a huge investment uh, on the Metaverse project. So I think uh, the Metaverse will be uh, uh, becoming more visible in the near future. Uh, everyone, I think uh, I would like to share my uh, presentation, please. Allow for me a second. Is it visible now, uh, Daniel? Okay. Yes, Good. Prof. Yes, very okay, clear, thank Prof. You. Thank you. And I would like to also to thanks to uh, Dr. Pip uh, for bringing uh, the landscape of the Indonesian's digital economy. Uh, that that's very that's very interesting because uh, metaverse uh, quite 
closely related with the conditions and the landscape of the uh, uh, digital economy as well as the internet access and equity. I think it's, 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 it's an excellent and thank you uh, for bringing that in, in, in this discussions. Uh, I would like to, uh, what is actually the uh, metaverse in, uh, in the implication of the uh, practice in a real, real life of the people? If you may visit ever the uh, second life, this basically is about uh, the metaphors is uh, quite related to uh, how the second life uh, is about. So the second life brings all of the members. Uh, it's it's open open. So it's, I think it's open for all of the participants. It's open for publics. So if you haven't joined this uh, second life, you may just uh, join the the second life uh, and uh, look at on how the. Uh, uh, second life uh, look like, but basically, I think the uh, the creator of the second life uh, is a, a kind of give the uh, members give us an opportunity to create uh, our uh, unfinished dream. If I'm not, I'm not, uh, and the unfinished dream that we haven't achieved, so we may create the dreams on uh, on this platform, the second life. So basically, the second life is uh, is just about the uh, what is the uh, metaphors? But it's becoming more uh, fascinating and becoming more intriguing because uh, the metaphors will uh, combining the assets, uh, the estate, and also the people. So that's that's why the law is becoming a, a real matter uh, in the uh, metaphors. Uh, so uh, this uh, in this session, then I'm going to talk more. Uh, about the uh, legal frameworks that on, and also the legal issues that may arise uh, when uh, the the metaphors will uh, will be uh, I think will be uh, feasible in the future. Let's take the uh, what is the metaphors? Then uh, metaphors at the first I think at the first sessions uh, already been. Uh, uh, mentioned by the speaker related to what is the metaphors are about, but in this one, uh, the metaphors in the future uh, is more highlighting on uh, there will be a buy, purchase, sell, or attend the event, events, the uh, joining the uh, memberships of the of the community uh, as we are representing by the avatar. So this part of the uh, uh, why the law is becoming more important uh, relating to the governance of the metaphors because there's a transactions and there is a contract and there is a communication between people and also there will be involved also the uh, uh, cryptocurrency, of course. Yeah, another one would be, uh, I, I got the uh, definition from the other from the other uh, sources, that the metaphors consists of the social hub. That's not a, another uh, dimension of the social hub. That means if you people are connected with the other people, then there would be likely uh, raise the uh, issues related to the private matters. Okay. So that's uh, that's uh, why the uh, law is becoming uh, important uh, related to the future metaphors uh, landscape. In a, a virtual uh, in in a virtual real estate, um, I, I, I mean uh, estate or real estate. In a virtual real estate, there are at least four uh, different uh, parties. That have to be uh, uh, to be access uh, to kind of to uh, complement the uh, the virtual asset that happens. So the contract between uh, the currency, the virtual asset, the platform, and the network have to be in place. This is part of why uh, the uh, the virtual asset is uh, different from the others because in in the uh, the asset in the in the platform of the metaverse, they need a currency, a digital currency at least. They also uh, require a platform or marketplace, and also they uh, require the network. 
and internet providers. The all of the parties has their own uh, duties and uh, responsibilities. This is part of the how the uh, uh, law has to be made a certain what is the right and the obligation obligation of the each parties in this uh, uh, in the virtual estate in the metaverse. This is the very common uh, and uh, uh, platform. Of the virtual estate, if you would like to visit, uh, including the upland, somnium space, and the the two giants uh, virtual estate marketplace will be Sandbox and Decentraland. So this this another uh, I think there are another another uh, uh, platform that that um, maybe uh, maybe already been uh, built or also it's going to be built uh, because the uh, the the metaverse uh, will be will be one of the promising uh, promising business in the future so i think this is part of the uh, development on uh, the virtual estate in the in the future sorry yeah, this is the example uh, I taken from uh, from the uh, one of the decentralized decentralized is uh, using the uh, virtual estate as part of uh, their offering uh, to all of the uh, member and to all of the uh, uh, participants uh, in the in the decentralized uh, uh, the uh, such, for example the uh, premise uh, in the buildings or also the landed house. So they're also offering this kind of type of the uh, virtual estate. This is another example of the uh, virtual estate that's offering in the central land, uh, including the warehouse, uh, the wearable houses, where, where, I think wearable source, uh, wearable shops, sketchers, H&M and others. So this this is the, uh, the example of the uh, virtual estate I just give you uh, how now it's becoming almost real, the almost real uh, the uh, the uh, metaphors uh, in the in the in the near future. How it works actually, the central land uh, provide a mechanism of a contractual agreement between the uh, the buyer and the seller. So basically, the central line on uh, offering a digital currency called as mana, and the virtual estate called as land. So it's just kind of a contractual agreement between parties uh, who already own uh, mana to uh, purchase land or uh, estate in a decentralized platform. That's quite very simple. There is no such kind of process related to the uh, if you buy a landed house in indonesia probably you have to go to the public notary you have to uh, go to the bank and anything but in this decentralized land uh, it's quite simple uh, because it's uh, just uh, based on a contractual agreement uh, uh, if you if you own mana and then you can uh, purchase any uh, estate that's offered in a decentralized land so the question is actually whether uh, the owner or the purchasers of the land or the virtual estate is protected as uh, secure as we own the real land. This is, is, is a real question. Okay, we are going to talk more about this one. Yeah. So this is the issues uh, related to how the virtual estate will be a reason, uh, I think, uh, in a metaverse uh, platform. First, related to your jurisdictions. Excuse me, Prof. Dar. Yep. Prof. Daryono, you still have five minutes left. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Okay, thank you. Thank thank you. you. Yeah. So there are four, or at least the four legal issues, uh, upcoming uh, four legal issues uh, that will be uh, real in a uh, uh, present in the uh, metaverse uh, platform, such as uh, jurisdictions, legal person qualifications, contract provisions, then the ownerships of the property interest. 
So the jurisdiction will be uh, related to the how the, the question about the uh, the origin of the rights. And of course, uh, related to the lex quarry, which law that should be governed. And also lex reciti, uh, which law that when the dispute arisen. This is part of the questions uh, because the on the metaverse, there is no jurisdictions. There is no nationality. So there will be, uh, there have to be a, a new a kind of uh, jurisdiction related to uh, to uh, to a certain on which law that should be used. In related to the uh, legal persons, because it's not real, with the the real uh, the the avatar is qualified as a person as a legal person to make any uh, uh, legal act. So this is another another uh, question related to uh, to the legal persons. Uh, uh, because it's a tax or it's peer uh, rights and duties and obligations when the person uh, assigned as whether as a purchaser or as a buyer. So the contract provisions uh, have to be different as I mentioned earlier. There are four uh, important parties uh, on securing the uh, assets uh, in a metaverse. The seller, the buyer, the marketplace platform or platform and the network pro providers. So there will be a different uh, contract uh, uh, related to the uh, uh, purchase and sale agreement on the of the estate uh, in the marketplace. So this is the question whether the principle of the real uh, property law applied, for example, the superficial solicited, uh, where the everything that uh, above and below the land uh, is uh, the right of the person who own land. This is uh, not. Of course, it's not applied. Whether the uh, ownership of the estate is a real right, uh, and, and of course not, uh, because uh, it attached to the people and it's becoming a pers uh, pers uh, personal rights. Whether it's immovable, whether it's uh, divided as a multiple uh, property interest, uh, whether the adverse possession is also applied, is this uh, trespassers also uh, apply the principle of trespassers? And another one would be uh, whether the termination of rights uh, is also applied. So this all the questions uh, that uh, uh, maybe maybe in uh, a kind of uh, creating a kind of a, a, a questionable uh, uh, issues uh, in in related to the real estate and the virtual estate. So there will be very different. Uh, uh, entities and there have to be a different law to govern these two. So yes, I guess I think uh, I would like to uh, propose for the new legal, legal framework uh, related to the virtual estate uh, have to be uh, new definitions and also the legality of the contracts and how the role of the parties or the assignment of the right duties and resp responsible between the four parties. And of course, we have to define the virtual property interest. And the last, uh, this much more impact, important is uh, how the legal remedies have to be ensured if there is a dispute uh, between the parties. Okay, thank you. Uh, I back to uh, Daniel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Prof. Dariano, for the very interesting and comprehensive explanation. I agree with Professor Dariano that we have to find out, you know, the appropriate jurisdictions for the metaphors because uh, reality and the metaphors, of course, is a very a different a word, you know. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now it's time for Q and A. Uh, we will we will give a two questions. We will give the opportunity for the two questions that we are going to ask to our presenter. So please, uh, committee, to show the two questions. Okay, and I hope that Dr. Utz is still 
with us, Dr. Pape. Are you still with us, Dr. Pape? Yes, of course. Okay. Okay, the question is for Dr. Pape. Uh, the question is from Fiolina. Uh, the question is, uh, boosting digital skills were mentioned before as an effort to make digital economy works for all. What are the digital skills needed to empower Indonesians to grow in the digital economy? Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Spep, to answer the questions. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. I think um, the um, digital skills, as we generally sort of like mention them, uh, it's true that it's sort of um, like more of a combination of different skills. And so let me quickly um, walk us through of what are some of the essential skills that are needed so that we can uh, talk about digital uh, skills. Um, obviously, digital skills, they do require to have literacy. Um, without literacy, it's going to be really difficult to, uh, to be able to use the internet. Um, but then at the same time, it requires skills to be able to use devices. So one needs to be able to like um, to know how to work, for example, with Android um, or on a computer with um, with the Microsoft uh, Windows. One needs to be able to understand apps and how to install apps, how to use apps, how to um, how to set up apps. Um, and then, of course, it also needs to have a basic understanding of how the Internet works. Um, and how sort of some, I would say, key apps work, for example, email apps, messenger apps, um, and understand the concept of email, I guess. This is um, because, well, for a lot of uh, accounts, one does need to register with it. So I think that would be like the basic set of skills. And then, of course, it goes a little bit beyond, like if one wants to, for example, do digital payments, it often requires to have a code generator at home that uh, creates a one-time password that needs to be entered to do a transfer. I mean, all of this for some of you might be everyday stuff and it's very obvious. I mean, others have never used this and uh, and it's um, quite a steep learning curve to like make sure to, to basically learn this kind of skill. Now, how can we create these skills for everybody in the population? I think it is helpful to divide the population um, for this purpose into a couple of different groups. The one group is are the young ones. So the young ones who still don't go to school, I think it's much easier. I mean, first of all, a lot of them grow up with using digital in one way or another. Um, and so I think using the normal school curriculum and of course adapting the curriculum towards digital skills is really important. But this is not gonna help people who are now, let's say 40 years or older and have not used digital before. So I think this normal school needs to be complemented with uh, other courses and other opportunities for people who are already older and are already working to create these skills. And this can either be normal programs and normal courses that you do at home, that you do in the evenings, or it can be courses that are um, basically combined with um, work skill programs. No, because um, the government does offer, for example, reskilling of workers. And those ones, for example, should include digital skills just to make sure that the worker who is participating in these courses can actually more flexibly adapt to changes in the working market by, for example, using uh, such skills. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. It's a very interesting answer. Yeah. So education goes back. Education is very important. You know, curriculum. You know, so for the young generations, you know, to study about the digital's. Uh, it, uh, skill. Okay, the next question is uh, committee, please. Committee. Uh, the next question. Okay, uh, the question is for Professor Dariano from uh, Bapa Firman Karim from Jakarta. Uh, after the pandemic era, we transformed to the new era metaverse, that the era full of virtual and digital reality and increase of white collar community that transformed to the new age scammers like blockchain community that burst allayed some money through NFT scam before sale completions. Such rug proof, who can take advantage by NFT crypto web 3.0? on investment crypto in scam project. So how can we reduce 
Scammers stole a whopping. Prof. Dariano, can you get the questions? How can we reduce scammers? I think that this is uh, okay. Prof, the floor yeah. is yours. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Firman, uh, for uh, very interesting and uh, I think it's very important topics uh, because uh, we we have kind of uh, scared by uh, any allegations uh, related to the uh, current uh, crypto and NFT as well. So I think the uh, yeah there have to be a uh, and unfortunately there is no such a, a comprehensive regulatory framework. Uh, develop yet in Indonesia uh, related to this uh, what to this uh, cryptocurrency. So the, I think the the most important for all of the uh, users uh, need to be aware of the consequences. That's the most important. So uh, choosing the best, uh, choosing the good uh, uh, virtual assets uh, will be one of the uh, have to be uh, one of the. Uh, priority in related to uh, to uh, uh, to avoid the uh, potential risk and uh, allegations so i think uh, this this one that uh, i would like to suggest uh, related to uh, pa firman uh, there have to be uh, i think uh, the loopholes related to the currency uh, cryptocurrency and also nft uh, is a widespread so i think uh, yeah uh, they need a regulatory framework, but unfortunately, until now, we, we haven't had yet the comprehensive uh, regulatory framework related to cryptocurrency. So my advice would be, uh, you have to choose the best uh, digital assets uh, and the secure one uh, for, uh, for, for investment uh, in the metaverse in the future. Okay, thank you, yeah. Prof. Doriano. Yeah, I agree with Professor Doriano. Yeah, so it is very important for us to keep in mind about buying our digital uh, devices. You know, so so that it is very important to keep our personal data. Okay, thank you very much, Prof, for the uh, very interesting uh, explanations. Uh, next committee, we still have another questions. Uh, okay. And this question is for Dr. Pip. This is from Stephen Anthony, Universitas Terbuka. Oh, it seems that we have two questions, Dr. Pip, from Stephen. Uh, the first question is, what makes startup growth, especially locals, slowing down at the end of pandemic? And the second is, are people starting to leave apps and start up when we close to endemic and back to reality uh okay the floor you. is yours dr peep thank you so much i mean that's a that's a very good question i mean first of all i have to admit i mean i don't have um the statistics showing that startups um that their growth is slowing down i think that's a really good question um i think it probably makes also sense to not well, to to I mean, like startups is like a very big word, no, and can like include almost anything. So I think it would probably make sense to like think about which kind of firms have been um, slowing their growth after the pandemic, and which ones have continued to grow. Um, and I think based on that, one could then sort of like try to see what kind of characteristics um, are helping. Um, to um, uh, for startups to sort of like continue to grow. So we have done actually a survey that has not yet been published among digital merchants and have looked what do digital merchants make um, make perform better. And so what is really important, especially if you think in the context of e-commerce, is that digital merchants are not only using a platform, for example, to offer their services and their goods, but that they also have a basic training in um in business, for example, how to keep an inventory, how to do accounting, at least some simple accounting, uh, and these kind of things, how to think about marketing, how to place your products. So this is really important. I mean, this is not as much startups, but this is much more the digital merchants, and they 
are really important as creating livelihoods among um, among people. So I think my general like reply to this question, I mean, I know it's a little bit generic, is that it is better to like look specifically in which kind of startups we are talking about, and then to see whether their growth actually has slowed or not uh, based on uh, like after the pandemic. And this, of course, in the end, I mean, it's market forces a lot, no? like market forces in terms of supply, in terms of demand does play a big role. And it is true that with other services becoming available, for example, going to a restaurant is a competitor and is a substitute in some context towards a food delivery. Well, yes, I mean, if restaurants open, then there is more competition. And so we would expect that there's a slow down in like growth of, for example, food delivery to home. But I wouldn't expect levels to return to what has been before the pandemic, because it does look like an overall trend around the world that digital services are more and more becoming accepted. So it's also good that in the question, it's formulated as a slowdown of growth rather than a reversal of growth, which, of course, is, makes, it makes a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pip, for the very interesting answer. And we have the last questions. And the last question is for Professor Dariano. Uh, the question is from Dona Widya Prof from Gandhari. Metaverse is a new technology nowadays. So how to reduce the risk and potential criminals acts in Metaverse? Please, Prof, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Yes, this, this uh, I think this is a very uh, important uh, uh, questions. And also, uh, even even myself, I think uh, I may not have any uh, any uh, conclusive uh, answer yet how to avoid the uh, potential of the criminal act from the, uh, especially from the uh, other jurisdictions. If in Indonesia, uh, if the the person will be in in Indonesia, then uh, there will be uh, more easier. Uh, it's uh, more easy for finding the uh, new the, the 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 regulatory framework related to the uh, uh, criminal acts or even the uh, fraudulence of the people who are using the metaphors. But if uh, they are coming from the overseas, then there would be uh, quite challenging. So uh, yes, of course, I think uh, the the self awareness would be very important. Uh, self awareness related to the uh, whether this uh, 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 the the contractual agreements between the parties uh, uh, is assured that uh, it can be can be enforceable. Uh, that's just one of the the uh, suggestions uh, related to uh, the potential of the. Avoiding the potential threat or potential uh, criminal act uh, uh, on the metaverse. Yeah. Okay, Mazenio. I think. Uh... Okay, Prof. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's very important, yeah, Prof. Yeah, to uh, for our uh, legislator to, uh, uh, of course, to ratify the criminal laws. Yeah. Uh, especially related to the metaphors, because as you mentioned before, that we need to set up or find out what is the appropriate jurisdictions for the metaphors. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we finally come to the end of the final discussions of the in the second sessions. Uh, before we and this second panel sessions. I would like to invite uh, our presenter today to give a close closing remarks and to Dr. Ostrand Pape, uh, your, the floor is yours. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. I think this was a really interesting discussion and I, uh, I really appreciate um, sort of like the more basic foundation that I hope my presentation helped to give and then um, Professor Dayono to sort of like go much more into the legal perspective. I mean, um, for me, what remains to say is uh, what I've sort of like tried to say at the end of the presentation. I think the digital opportunities are like really abundant and they can like really be a game changer, not only in 
creating economic growth, but also towards inclusivity of like making sure that people can actually leapfrog towards better services, better uh, better choices and better jobs. But to make this possible, it is really important to make sure that we create digital opportunities for everybody. And this means to get fund for like foundationals right. And some of these foundations are connectivity, making sure that they are available in rural areas to make sure that digital skills are available to everybody Uh, the young and the older people, as well as to people in rural areas and as well as urban areas. And then finally, for the government to also utilize the digital economy to provide better services with higher quality and better targeted, because this can really be a game changer. And so I think for all these three aspects, that's what also the metaverse would be standing on if we discuss a metaverse that is really a change of society, a change in the economy, rather than something that is more like a playground for 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 some people and so for that it is really important to make sure that the metaverse as terms of like in a productive metaverse does not undermine uh, the equality in society thank you okay. thank you dr pip and now it's the time for Dr. professor dariano to okay, thank you. give his okay, thank closing you. Uh, thank you david i'm echoing uh, dr pip uh, uh, closing a remark related to Uh, that the metaverse will be uh, one of the game changing in the world. Uh, then uh, I think, yes, I think I definitely agree that the uh, it's not only for uh, the uh, the upper middle class uh, that the metaverse would serve, but the most important I think uh, on the equity and also the inclusivity, uh, how the metaverse could be used as a one of the uh, digital uh, fostering digital economy and also uh, I think. Uh, Uh, increasing the welfare of the community at whole uh, in Indonesian people, and also the I think the most important is eradicating the poverty. As the uh, uh, regulatory re regulatory framework has not been set yet uh, in Indonesia, then I think uh, the the metaverse have to be based first on a contractual basis. So the legal provisions on a contract have to be made. Uh, detail and comprehensive related to ensure and secure the parties involved, just uh, avoiding the potential dispute or uh, potential uh, allegations to the contract. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think uh, the metaphors will be one of the game changes uh, as mentioned by, by uh, Dr. Pip. That's good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Doriano. What a very fantastic and wonderful day, ladies and gentlemen. Today that we have heard a very great and comprehensive presentation from our two distinguished speaker, Professor Doriano and Dr. Oops Jones Pape. Uh, it's Ladies and gentlemen, apparently we still have enormous questions as we see them on the chat. However, due to the limit time, we need to end our panel discussions. But before we end, I would like all of us to give applause for our two distinguished panels today. Please give applause. Thank you. Now it's time for the appreciations. Uh, we would like to give a certificate to our two distinguished uh, speakers, uh, to the committee, please uh, sh sh show the certificate. Okay. Uh, Dr. Utz John Pape, uh, as an appreciation from us, <coughs> Universitas Terbuka, we would like to uh, certificate this or to present it this to, in recognition of your participation as a plenary speaker. And the second certificate of appreciation is presented to Professor Dariano. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for your uh, presence and very insightful presentations in our second discussion span, our second discussions. Now, Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end this second panel discussions and I wish you good health. And metaverse is not enough yet. The innovations of technology is growing rapidly and we will see more and more technology, technological innovations. And 
we would like to see you next year. So thank you very much to our distinguished speakers and thank you very much for our uh, guests, to the participants for your presence. Now, I'm Daniel Pasaribu, would like to close this panel discussion and give it to our uh, Master of Ceremony, uh, Mr. Yonan. To Mr. Yonan, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Daniel. It's one of the fruitful discussion you led. Congratulations. And also, thank you very much to Dr. Uj Johan Pep and Professor Dr. Dariono for the being here to join us today. And uh, of course, we are so happy to have you all here today. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. As today's agenda is coming to an end, we'd like to thank all our speakers, Dr. Liu Von Kiong, Chief Business Officer, Centriforce Malaysia, Dr. Uj Johan Peib, Senior Economist, Poverty and Equity Global Practice, Global Lead for Data for Operational Impact, World Bank, Dr. Indrawan Nugroho, CEO and co-founder at CIS Indonesia, and Professor Dr. Daryono, Professor in Property Law and Law Technology Universitas Terbuka Indonesia. And also, for all of the presenters and participants of the fourth Open Society Conference 2022, we are very pleased and honored to have you here with us today. I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Law, Social and Political Sciences, Universitas Terbuka, Dr. Sofjan Arifin, to give the closing remark. Dr. Sofjan Arifin, the time is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, excuse me, clear my voice? Yes, okay. clear. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Honorable Speakers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to express my appreciation to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Lee Hun Kiong, Dr. Indrawan Nugroho, Dr. Yuti Johan Pep, and Professor Dr. Daryono for their favorable favorable contribution to our conference today. My deepest credit goes to all who attended the conference and helped to make it much a successful event. We have reached at the end of the fourth Open Society Conference 2022. Look out the day event. The issue regarding perspective and impact of the metaphors on sustainable development goal were discussed by the speakers. I hope this conference gives you an available experience. Before ending my closing remarks, I would like to announce the winner of the Best People and the Best Presenter Award. The Best People Award goes to Andre Imam and Pika Ananda, Ki A Unipata. Universal language translator in the in this the future of the doom of the language learning. And the second, uh, Mr. Bani Pamukas, the <clears throat> for the people and the internet, uh, the future of GT and the metaverse era. Area Indonesian Cities Ready. And the best presenter award goes to Arif Darmawan for the people entitled is Metaverse Digitalization Presenting and Quantifying. And the second, Dewi Nilam Tias. 
for the Hyper Entertainment is the Android-based learning video innovation to improve digital literacy as a social lifestyle in education for elementary school teachers. Congratulations on your achievement. The committee will contact you for detailed information. Finally, I would like to extend my graduate to the organizing committee for running a smooth event. Since the Open Society Conference is an annual event, we look forward to seeing you again in 2023. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, stay safe and hardly. So, thank you very much, Dr. Sofjan Arifin, for the closing remark, and of course, congratulations for all the winners. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a productive and inspiring day. I hope you found today's presentation an informative and helpful. Opens you to board new knowledge from the all experts coming from national and international institutions. I also hope that now we have a new perspective and preparing for a forthcoming impact of metaverse on SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to have a photo session before we end the conferences. And please turn on your camera and the committee will take the picture page by page. The committee, please. Okay, for all participants, please turn on your camera. You would like to take your picture page by page. One, two, three. And then the next page. One, two, three. And the third page. One, two, three. And the next page. One, two, three. And the last page. One, two, three. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, before you leave the event, please fill out the evaluation form the link provided in the chat box. Finally, I would leave you with a quote by Mark Zuckerberg, the man who changed our social life, who said, finding your purpose isn't enough. The challenge for our generation is creating a world where everyone has a sense of purpose. Thank you. Thank you and thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.